Hello and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on various platforms such as Facebook, our iTunes channel, and as well as BCTV. So however you're tuning into us today, thank you for joining us. My name is Olga Peters. I am the host of this podcast and this is the show where we talk about how things in Montpelier shake out for the rest of us. Welcome, regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser. Hello. Hello, good to see you, Olga. Good to see you too. And so happy to meet you for the first time. Charlie Parker, is it Glisserman? Yes, Charlie Parker Glisserman. Great that to meet you too. An awesome last name, by the way. I love Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Those who don't know Charlie, she is the policy manager and Prop 5 campaign manager of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England out of their Colchester office. And uh, so glad you can join us. I'm looking forward to talking about Prop 5, which I think a lot of people probably just perked up their ears and went, what, what's that? <laughs> So, uh, Charlie, I would love to just dive in and hear about the work you're doing on Prop 5, which, for those who don't know, is the potential amendment to amend the Vermont Constitution to protect reproductive freedom or reproductive liberties, uh, however you would like to, to say that. So I'd love to hear more, Charlie. Yeah, thank you. So Prop 5, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, as Olga said, is a proposed amendment to the Vermont Constitution that would protect reproductive freedom for every person in Vermont. Um, and what reproductive freedom means in this context is the right to become pregnant and carry a pregnancy to term and choose or refuse sterilization, contraception, and abortion. Um, so the bottom line here is that People should be making their own decisions about their lives, their reproductive lives, their careers. And so we want to make sure that in our strongest legal document in this state, the Vermont Constitution, that that is protected. And long term, that's not something that Vermonters will have to worry about every day. Um, and that is really a privilege when we're looking at the national landscape um, where almost 26 states could soon greatly restrict and ban abortion. Um, and so we in Vermont are taking this proactive step to protect reproductive freedom, no matter what happens in Washington, DC. Thank we've, been, we've been on the path of this step for quite a while. We're like, it's we're almost at the finish line, right? Yeah, exactly. So changing a constitution um, is no easy task and it shouldn't be, right? Changing the constitution is a big deal. Um, and so in Vermont, uh, these amendments need to be approved by the legislature, the House and the Senate in two terms. And then um, if it passes those four legislative votes, it goes to the Vermont voters in the next general election. So. We are three votes down, one vote to go in the upcoming legislative session in January, 2022. And if it passes the House of Representatives, it will go to Vermont voters as a ballot measure in the 2022 general election on November 8th. And wow. for really attentive listeners, you, or those of you who wanna go back into the archives, in August, Olga and I took a little bit of a summer hiatus and read the Vermont Constitution aloud for our listeners. And so if anyone wants to hear the context that this reproductive justice amendment is gonna sit in, you can go back and listen to our August episodes where we just read the constitution without giggling. And that was actually a really it profound, was, it was a profound experience despite being a little hard. There were some giggly bits. So- There were giggly bits, yes. Um, I think what's, and then the other piece that was interesting to me as I've been voting on the constitutional amendments, um, this one in particular, is that once it passes for the first time, it can't be amended. Mm, and so that is interesting. we just need to pass it as it is. The Senate starts it, they get to debate the language of it, and then it is what it is. Um, and it's an up or down vote. There are no amendments allowed. 
Mm -hmm. And I would love just a little clarity from either Charlie or this is more of a process question or Emily. Um, for an amendment to pass, it has to pass two legislatures, as I remember. But is that two consecutive years? Is it two bienniums, which would be essentially four years? I'm a little foggy on that. One. So a biennium is two years. And so right. it needs to pass in two separate biennium. And the idea of that, and so that is over a four year span. Mm -hmm. And I believe, not that I helped write the constitution where this was spelled out, but um, I believe the intent, intention or intent of that was that you want two separate legislative bodies to weigh in on this because the legislature changes fairly significantly between biennium. And mm -hmm. so it's not just that you're voting on it twice for sort of confirmation sake, you're voting on it twice so that more people can be part of the process. There can there's an opportunity for significant political action or change if voters are unhappy with that first vote. Um, mm -hmm. And so it provides a level of both accountability um, and much broader consensus and a chance for sort of voters to weigh in on what the legislature has done um, in between biennium. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. Well, just to say that it, it, it's also a confirmation that you aren't changing the Constitution on a whim, yeah. right? Like this is a long process. This is not just a um, like an artifact of a political moment. This is something that Vermont legislators and Vermont voters um, feel really deeply about. And that's those are the things that should be reflected in our Constitution. And um, I think this amendment and reproductive freedom absolutely kind of falls in that bucket. And help put this in context. There's so much flying around around reproductive freedom in the rest of the country focus mostly on abortions but as you just said uh this this amendment will protect more than than just the right to choose um how does this proposition and the direction vermont's taking how does that fit in the national context mm -hmm. that's a great question um well as we may have heard uh, last week, the Supreme Court um, heard a case, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, where they heard a direct challenge to Roe v. Wade. And so that means when they're deciding on this case, um, which is a, a case to uphold a Mississippi abortion ban at 15 weeks, they could potentially overrow Roe v. Wade. Um, and we have a majority of Supreme Court justices that are hostile to reproductive rights. And so this is a threat to reproductive rights nationally that um, we really haven't experienced in the 50 years that we've enjoyed Roe's precedent. And with the fate of Roe v. Wade hanging in the balance, uh, state level protections for reproductive freedom um, go, grow even more important and are, are critical to protecting um, these vital rights. Um, the right to get an abortion if you need it, um, but also a variety of other reproductive and sexual health care. And so Vermont has an opportunity here um, to be the first state in the nation to explicitly protect reproductive freedom in its constitution and really set an example for the nation about what we can do in this really dark time to take a stand and say, you know, the majority of people in our country think that these rights are important and should be protected. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I'm just really excited to be a part of this process. Yeah, you know, it's, um, I think we're entering in you know, just a couple of weeks, we'll be in basically the last year of what's been, I think, about a five-year process. Mm -hmm. And I was very involved in the debate, especially around um, H57, which was just sort of a simple law that offered some of these protections. And I will just really like talking about this stuff and feel really comfortable talking about this stuff. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to talk about so that some of the stigma is removed. And I, in all of that, I was, you know, starting to feel a little bit more casual about all of it. Like I, you know, not really 
not jaded per se, but that, you know, the Supreme Court couldn't surprise me anymore with the horrors. Texas couldn't break me anymore with what they want to do to, you know, people's bodies. Um, and what we're doing in Vermont is just sort of what we do in Vermont and all. And then, and then I listened to some of the Supreme Court conversation and I cried. And then um, we had our House Democratic Caucus meeting last Saturday. And Speaker Kerwinski was talking about the fact that we're about to do this. And I just, you know, and I've heard her talk about this, you know, dozens of times before. And all of a sudden, it really just hit me how powerful it is that we can do this in Vermont, that this is possible in Vermont, that we had the foresight to start this process five years ago to get this done. Um, and that if like it, you know, if things get as bad as they seem they're going to get in all of these other states, Vermont can at least be there as an anchor for folks. Mm -hmm. it was, you, yeah, man. it's really amazing. I, what I keep coming back to um, with, with, with this, I, I, I said it before that when we talk about reproductive freedoms and liberties, a lot of focus does tend to go towards abortion, um, which for a lot of people is probably a firebrand or a dog whistle for I think many people, unfortunately. What I appreciate about this amendment is the how much it protects people. That it it is it goes to choice on so many different levels. And it looks at reproductive freedom in a more holistic um a holistic view that i think probably will impact more people than than folks realize and even just um the fact that you can choose or refuse sterilization which let's face it in vermont there was a history of forced sterilization that's no small thing um and so for me this is this is very big and i think it can protect generations of people so um, thank you to everyone who has who has worked on that. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, as we, you know, we offered that eugenics apology last year, and that was quite, quite impactful when we talked about it on the show. Mm -hmm. um, but that there could be a next step from that, and that this is that next step. It's really, you know, we can apologize all we want, but this is a way of saying never again. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I, I think it's really important, and I will defend people's right to have an abortion um, and until, what is it called? The cows, the cows come home. Um, <laughs> but I also think that reproductive freedom more broadly is, is incredibly important in people's lives. You know, people of all genders get abortions. People of all genders access different forms of reproductive health care. Um, I know the impact that my access to contraception has had on my life. I would not be here in my career um, or my schooling or my social life and hobbies if I didn't have access to contraception. And that should not be a, a, a privilege. That should be a right. And um, the state should never interfere with my ability to make those decisions for myself. And so um, I think that this amendment is also a really great challenge for us to um, talk about the importance of abortion and also talk about the importance of broader reproductive rights mm -hmm. and the importance of being able to have children mm -hmm. and the impact that that can have on people's lives when they want to do that and they feel like they're ready to take that step. Um, and I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, we we talk about abortion more exclusively because other rights aren't under attack in the same way that abortion is. And abortion's absolutely under attack, but um, I think it's a very white cis-centric feminist view to say that people's ability to have children isn't under attack. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at our broken <laughs> child protection system and restricted access to artificial reproductive technology, and 
no, the amendment won't solve all of these problems. These are continuing policy conversations that we all need to have. But we as a movement are going to be held back if we don't talk about reproductive rights, health, and justice and within this broader framework. Thank you, Charlie. Any, um, I, I liked what you said about there are broader policy discussions because one thing I also find interesting about this amendment is that it really, we are putting our flag in the ground and saying this is important to us and we will protect it. And it, it makes me wonder for you, Emily, what other ripple effects do you think legislatively could come out or, or policy-wise could come out of this? Because, you know, Charlie just made some really good points about, you know, our broken child care system, um, protective child system. Child protection system. Thank you. Wow, that just went, whew. Um, <laughs> and, and I think you could even talk about whether sex education for for young people is strong enough and access to contraceptive contraceptives are strong enough what do you what do you think yeah i mean there's so many pieces of that there's the fact that people still really in most cases need to get their spouse's consent before they get you know sterilized um mm. or their family's consent or have to wait until they're a certain age or i mean there's just so there's that which is just sort of like it's remarkable to me how um gendered those conversations still are. And then there's the cost of them and whether or not those costs are covered by health insurance and what we somehow, that we provide healthcare coverage for some births, um, but we don't often provide healthcare coverage for the choice not to birth um, mm -hmm. or for the option to get pregnant. So um, I think Charlie sort of touched on this idea that alternative I don't even want to say alternative, but more medical, essentially, um, paths to getting pregnant are often not covered by health insurance and are really, really hard for people to access. Um, the system that we have for adoption in this country has um, both levels of complication and levels of corruption and an amount of money that is required to access it that is really, like, absolutely stunning when you dive into it. Um, and then there's the, and then our child protection system, which really um, profoundly discriminates against poor people and people of color and whether or not they're able to parent their children. There are a lot of policy implications there. And so there's both sort of the, what is the state willing to pay for and not willing to pay for? What is the state willing to regulate and not willing to regulate? And then there's the last layer of like, is the state willing to take a hard look at it? ourselves? Are we willing to take a hard look at ourselves and say, do the systems that we have in place to care for people to regulate things, are they meeting the goals of this amendment? Are they legal in the context of this amendment? And that's where things like, say, the child protection system really sit with me. It's that people might think um, that we have a right to parent in this country, um, but I, that's not true for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm excited for what this might open up for conversations and how it, um, not in terms of, you know, I think sometimes when we have a guide star to have these policy conversations, it makes them much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Charlie, what did, did anything Emily say just bring up anything for you? All the things. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, one, one statistic that has just absolutely haunted me um, for, for many years now is that in our country, one in four people after they give birth, go back to work within 10 days. D just think about that. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, for, for our listeners here, if any of you have given birth or been around people who have given birth, my lovely sister just gave birth to my niece this year. And it, it even sent it more home going through that process and seeing her stage of recovery at 10 days after she gave birth. Um, and so our lack of paid family and medical leave um, solutions in in our state and in our our nation is is a huge problem and 
you know, have been a lot, a big part of the conversation around the Build Back Better package. And so just one other thing that I think uh, is really missing in this system of supporting people and their ability to make their reproductive decisions and, and carry them out so that they can lead the lives they want to lead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Emily, what have, if you can throw your mind back to the, the way back machine and think about some of the conversations that happened um, around this amendment in the legislature, what were some of the things that came up for people across the board? I'm not positive, negative, for, against, whatever. My abilities with the Wayback Machine are really severely um, <laughs> hindered lately, Olga. I have completely lost time. And um, frankly, the debate around age 57, which was a quite narrow, and I wish I remembered the act number. Maybe you remember the act number, Charlie. Um, the, which was really explicitly about a right to abortion. Um, and my memory of that debate is um, a little mixed up with my memory of um, voting on the reproductive liberty amendment. But, um, you know, the conversations are often, you know, slippery slope conversations. Um, mm you know, if we do this, then here is this catastrophic thing that will happen. Um, that's sort of what the anti side is in Vermont for almost anything like that, just sort of because we um, yeah. have this like, and I think we just talked about this last week or the week before, like, because we have our Republicans tend to be fairly moderate Republicans and are interested in being portrayed as moderate Republicans, the extremist language that's used in other states very rarely comes up. And most of the time it's slippery slope and like fears of slippery slopes. And I don't even know what a slippery, like, I mean, I guess my walkway right now is a slippery slope. And like, it's okay. <laughs> I was gonna say, it's snowing it's okay to walk down a slippery slope. Like you can get traction if you, before you fall, you know? Um, and I think particularly in this context, it's, you know, when we talk about people's rights, it's in, it's interesting to me that that's scary. It's scary mm -hmm. to give someone a right. Um, it's scary to, because we don't give rights, right? It's that we promise to not take rights away as a, yeah. like people have their rights. Um, and the fact that as a state, we would make promises to not remove those is sort of remarkable to me um, that, that, that that's hard for people. Um, I, I understand I that sometimes rights are competing, right? And we mm -hmm. talk about that a lot in the context of, say, gun control legislation. Um, but in this case, I'm not sure how reproductive liberty is competing with anyone else's, any, you know, autonomous person's rights. And so that is a really powerful part of it for me. Um, when we talk about the conversations about why this is a good thing, sort of that side of the debate, um, Certainly when we started, it was much more about let's, you know, show, show America what Vermont can do. Um, because I think the situation that we're in now, while many people saw it coming, wasn't as immediate or real to people. Um, mm -hmm. That no one thought that we could get this close to Roe being overturned. Yeah. Um, and so when we first started the debate, it was, you know, let's be a shining light and less about let's make sure that Vermonters are okay. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really complicated for some of us to think about reproductive rights as globally as Charlie framed them um, mm -hmm. and framed them very well. Um, because our own reproductive experiences have often been quite narrow. That's a good um, point. And so, you know, I've accessed much contraception in my life. I've accessed abortions in my life. Um, I've given birth and I've parented and I have had very little infringe on that parenting. Um, you know, even with the family medical leave, like I hadn't even left my tiny apartment at nine days, like not even to go for a walk. Um, 
and I didn't have to. I had, you know, loved ones and neighbors like bringing me food and caring for me and all of that. And um, I had the financial freedom for um, to make that possible. And so to think, you know, as the legislature becomes more diverse, and it certainly has in the last few years, we have more people who have needed to access artificial insemination in order to get pregnant. Um, or, you know, a year ago, we had um, a representative whose husband gave birth and parented. Um, and so the legislature has, I think, moved a pretty long way in just a couple of years to even having language for sort of a full scope of what reproductive freedom means. But the piece about the what this means in the context of the child protection system, um, I think is gonna be a new reckoning for us. Um, and it's one I'm excited about because I think it, I think, like I said, it gives us a guide star in those conversations that we haven't had before. The idea that people have a right to parent regardless of their class and race status is really, it's really, really powerful. It's a really powerful idea. And I don't think it's how we usually think about it. I think usually mm -hmm. we think that we know better than someone does um, or that we're protecting people. But that's the exact same argument that, you know, kept me from being able to get my tubes tied when I was 30 um, mm. and the doctor refused to do it. So, wow. and I think, every, you know, I think that one becomes an, like at where we are culturally now, people are like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. But like, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I was 30. So the conversation's evolving and it's, I'm glad that we have this guide star to help us evolve that conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Folks, we are going to hear from some of our underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, but stay tuned. Emily, Charlie, and I will be back in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. As I mentioned in the first half, you can also find us on BCTV, wherever you find podcasts and Emily's YouTube channel as well. I um, am speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three reps for the town of Brattleboro. I'm also speaking with Charlie Parker Glisserman from uh, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. So thank you both for being here today. And we're talking, if you're just joining us, about Prop 5, which is a potential amendment to the Vermont Constitution. And since we are about to dive into some political things, Emily, what do we have to remind listeners of? Well, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, not the radio station, nor the TV station, nor whatever platform you choose to stream any of this information, nor any of our employers or subcontractors or prime contractors or really any of our family members. It's just the opinions of the people that are saying this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we are happy to own them. So thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, before we dive back into the conversation, uh, I just want to quickly read the amendments language, just so our listeners have a, a grounding for that. Maybe you could read and it slowly instead of quickly. Hmm? You said you were gonna read it quickly, but I wondered if maybe it would be better if you read it slowly. I can do that too. Knowing me, it will be slowly anyways, because I'm not a fast reader. <laughs> so here we go. That an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life, life course and shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. So there you go. That's the amendment. And that's, that's a lot happening in those, that small piece of text there. Um, Charlie, did you just get a little teary when she read that? I, I, I am a such teary. a nerd. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do, it, make, it makes, it, it touches me sometimes because 
Um, I, for one, think the language is really beautiful. And it also makes me think about um, just all of the work that went into making those words and how much collective ownership we have over that in this state that, you know, I think sometimes people don't really feel like they're engaged in the legislative processes and they don't have access to that. But I really think that the ballot measure process, you know, really demonstrates that that this this is for all of us in Vermont. And so, yeah, I sometimes get a little emotional about it. That makes me feel really good. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm yeah. a little teary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love us to turn Charlie, I believe Planned Parenthood of Northern New England has a um, Prop 5 campaign. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? What does it entail? What is it? How can people access it if they're interested? Absolutely. Um, so Planned Parenthood of Northern New England has championed the Reproductive Liberty Amendment for the last few years and really enjoyed working with the legislature and our supporters and volunteers on moving it forward. Um, now in my role uh, as the policy and Prop 5 campaign manager with Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund, um, I am uh, what I'd like to think of as, as a convener of a campaign coalition um, that is going to lead the charge on the Reproductive Liberty Amendment over the next year. Um, and you can find more information about us at reprolibertyvt.org. Um, and, you know, I think one really interesting thing to note here is that um, Vermont isn't a, a statewide ballot measure state. You know, the, the only time that we have a public question on our ballot statewide is when we're amending our constitution. And so this is a really interesting um, experiment and, and time for Vermont to see what these campaigns look like. Um, the, we don't change our constitution that often, oftentimes um, they're, they're pretty sleepy. And so um, I'm really looking forward over the next year to really getting Vermont voters and other members of our public engaged in this. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, this amendment is for all of us. And so we all have a role to play in moving it forward and making sure that we can protect our own reproductive rights and the rights of our neighbors and future generations in Vermont. And so this kind of campaign run and Vermont voter centered campaign um, is really what we're looking to do over the next year. Mm -hmm. Emily, do you remember how this amendment came to be? Did a lawmaker bring it forward? Was it brought forward by community members? Do you, do you remember? Muted. Um, when, <laughs> so when I was first getting engaged in running for office um, or thinking about running for office or just however to describe it, we were having conversations about an equal rights amendment Mm -hmm. um, quite extensively. And I was part of a coalition of folks around the state that wanted to bring back um, an equal rights amendment in Vermont, that if we couldn't pass it on a federal level, we should at least pass it in Vermont. Um, and I actually think it might be helpful for a moment to highlight what happened with the equal rights amendment in Vermont, because the last time it came to a vote, it actually failed. Um, it was a snowy day. It was a very, very snowy day in Vermont and people did not turn out to the polls. And so the people who wanted to vote against after a pretty serious public and nasty campaign got out and cleared off their cars and went to vote against. And the number of people who um, were expected to come out and vote for didn't, didn't go clear their cars off. Um, was this, this, this was the 1970s, 1980s? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, 
And so I like always remember that vote when I think about this vote, like very, and it seems Charlie does too. She's nodding. Um, and just like what it means to have to support something that you need to keep on showing up, even if you think that, you know, everyone else is with you. Mm -hmm. um, but so because constitutional amendments can only be introduced in certain biennium, um, there was conversations about sort of what the constitutional amendment would be that was most appropriate. Um, and so leadership in both the House and the Senate, um, Senator Lyons and um, Representative Pugh, who are sort of the chairs of the relevant committees here, um, worked really closely with a really broad coalition of stakeholders, including Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Um, and the majority leader who was in the Senate then, Senator Ballant, um, and the majority leader who is, um, was in the majority leader in the House then, Jill Kerwinski, who are now the leaders of both of their chambers, the, you know, the speaker and the pro tem. Um, so really figure out sort of what the best path was forward for this. And so um, the AG's office weighed in quite a bit. Um, Planned Parenthood Action Fund was very much there as part of this process. And then a whole lot of other stakeholders around the state to make sure that this was um, really something that would meet the needs of not just cis white women. Um, that we were finding language and finding a path forward that spoke more broadly to the values um, that Vermonters hold dear on this. Mm -hmm. Thank did you. I, was that, did that work for a history, Charlie? What did I leave out at all? Like I said, my way back <laughs> was like very broken since the pandemic. Um, I think I just want to emphasize like one bit, um, which is the, the breadth and depth of the organizations and advocates that have been behind this amendment. Um, it has been so incredible to see healthcare providers, civil rights advocates, advocates for gender equity, advocates for BIPOC, advocates for queer and trans people, advocates for early childhood um, and business and so, so much more really mobilizing around this. Um, I think it speaks to you how reproductive freedom impacts all of our lives so profoundly and, and in turn impacts our communities and the people around us and, um, you know, the way that our state functions so profoundly. Um, and that is part of why we really wanted to build this campaign coalition so that all of these organizations hand in hand are moving this forward um, in their kind of collective interest in the interest of Vermonters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's really, um, you know, just one small example to just like sort of bring that home for folks in the Wyndham County area is that, you know, when I talk to the folks that out in the open, which is our, um, which is a national organization, but one located in Brattleboro that focuses on issues for rural queer folk. Um, this is the top of their legislative agenda for the year. And um, when I meet with my colleagues in the Rainbow Caucus, um, which is a caucus of legislators who identify somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum, um, this is, you know, this is something that we're dedicating like a whole prep meeting to. All the other issues, you know, we like throw 10 into one meeting, but this is one where we're like, we have to get ready for this for the session. This is a really important issue to us. And so as it sort of moved forward, you know, and the Commission on Women was really involved when I was on the commission. And so as it's moved forward, um, I think it's really been incredible to see how many people can find common vision in this work. I also, um, Sorry, go ahead. Do you want to? No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I um through the conversation, sort of narrowly around um, H fifty seven that was about abortion rights, and then in this deeply broadened conversation around the constitutional amendment, I get a lot of um, not a lot, but I get regular emails from constituents who write to me from a deeply religious Christian perspective, um, mm -hmm. the asking about this um, and expressing their discomfort or concern about it. And they often try to find, um, they're seeking common ground with me um, 
as Christians in our common values. And I have been searching and seeking and like doing research to try to figure out a way to respond to that from my own faith and cultural background, which is not Christian, which is Jewish. And um, there's a really long history in both Jewish culture and Jewish religion and texts that ab abortion and a really very full range of reproductive and sexual behaviors and um, care are not just like protected, but celebrated, like con mm -hmm. considered a good thing, um, considered a mitzvah, that an abortion, if it like, Im you know, improves the life of the person getting an abortion is a good thing to do. Um, mm -hmm that it's like very, it's very sacred, um, those things. And so it's, I've been trying to find my, I just like sort of want to name that somewhere because I actually haven't talked to anyone about it yet. And here we are having this conversation um, that it's something that I'm trying to find my way through is like how to talk about this from a place of my own faith. And I think that's going to be a really, and I think when we think about sort of this broad coalition and what it means for each person in the coalition to talk about it from the perspective of their faith or their life story, you know, whether that's their race or their class or their gender identity or their religion. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for each of us to find our way towards this um, and to tell our own story in it. And I think that's going to be really powerful. And I have a lot of respect, Charlie, for how you have carried that, um, that broad coalition forward through this conversation. Thank you. Um, and I have just been uh, so I don't know if humbled is, is really the right word, but, um, to just see the number and diversity of people of faith and leaders of faith who have supported, um, this amendment publicly and talked about it with their congregations. Um, if you go to the reprolibertyvt.org website, um, you can see an op-ed that was signed by, I believe, 20 religious leaders in Vermont about why they think it's just so important to protect the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, and that people of faith and leaders of faith are among our endorsers and our coalition. And it's been really interesting um, for me as someone um, who does not practice any faith to see people speak from, from those values. Um, in support of reproductive freedom. Um, and honestly has helped me challenge a lot of biases that I held about um, how people of faith thought about reproductive rights. I was absolutely proven wrong. And I think that that's also something to really keep in mind um, as we're moving forward with the amendment. Thank you both of you for those, those comments because I, I I think in the first half of the show, Emily um, touched on this, that how important it is, especially around reproductive freedoms to get really comfortable about talking mm -hmm. about our experiences, about where we sit with, with these issues, with these rights, with, with these histories. Um, so, so thank you. I think both of those are just such great examples of, of that. I want to give a plug at this moment for the podcast that Planned Parenthood Action Fund is doing as part of this campaign that is co-hosted by our own Lisa Kuhneman, who uh -huh. um, lives in Guilford and um, is just a fantastic person and I think doing a really great job with the podcast. So mm -hmm. um, where can what, folks find that? What's it called, Charlie? It is called Reproductively Speaking, um, which so yeah. is so cute. Um, and you can find it on Spotify. Um, and a little bit about the podcast. Um, it is um, a short podcast um, that highlights the reproductive freedom stories of three people in Vermont. Um, and I think, you know, similar to, to what you were saying, Olga, um, is an attempt to destigmatize reproductive health care. Um, I, throughout my time with Planned Parenthood, have heard from so many people um, 
how they have never talked with someone about their abortion, how they've never talked with someone about their miscarriage or pregnancy loss. Um, and this creates so much shame and so much isolation, isolation in our society that doesn't need to be there. And so one of our goals for this podcast, Reproductively Speaking, um, was to try and open up conversation, create some dialogue in our state uh, about reproductive health care to hopefully destigmatize these topics and help people find some common ground around them. So reproductively speaking on Spotify, give it a listen. Thank and you. Actually, I will also gonna... try to link to it in the show notes. I'm going to give another plug for another Wyndham County project related to um, testimonials around really the diverse range of reproductive liberty issues, which is the film Break the Silence, um, mm. which Willow Farrell did along with a whole really fantastic team of women um, down here, including Lisa Kuhneman. And folks, that is a documentary that sort of highlights these different reproductive um, history stories and sexual health stories. And so folks can find that at breakthesilencedoc.com, D-O-C for doc. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm still amazed at um, how much society likes to weigh in on women's choices around uh, reproductive choices, around sexual choices, um, around whether to have a child, whether not to have a child, uh, whether to get married, whether not to get married. It just, it blows my mind how, how people um, still feel they can weigh in. And again, going back to what you just said with the podcast and the film, the more women can talk about their own experiences. I think that will help kind of push back that tide of, well, we're going to tell you what we think should, should happen. Um, and so I would say not you. just women, I would say everyone talking about their experiences. Um, I think mm -hmm. yes. in some ways folks who don't identify as women have even less spaces and places to talk about whatever reproductive experiences they've had. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. That's a very good point. Um, we have just over five minutes left before we have to sign off. So I want to I want to make sure if there's any other threads we need to pull or any anything else we want listeners to to know before we we run out of time on this well, very deep conversation. So I have a lot of people who write to me and tell me um, that they're you know great supporters and they very much want me to vote for um, the amendment. And I will of course vote for the amendment. I would vote for it three times if I could, but I only get to vote for it twice and the second time's coming up soon. And then I say, okay, like, you know, you organized me, great. That was an easy win for you. Here's the next step, which is organizing your community for this referendum. And Charlie, I wonder if you could share with people how they could get engaged for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 2022 is going to be a big year. Um, there is so much work to be done and it will require so many of us across the state to do it. And so the first step in really getting involved um, in the Reproductive Liberty Amendment and preparing for the public vote is to go to reprolibertyvt.org and pledge to vote yes on the amendment. That'll make sure that you stay up to date on how the campaign's doing, that you know when we have action opportunities and you can volunteer with us. Um, and of course, I will kind of include in the show notes, my contact information. I am available to talk about this with anyone, anytime, and let's get you engaged. Thank you, Charlie. Emily, anything you want listeners to know? No, I want everyone to get engaged with Charlie. <laughs> so I'm going to share, Emily shared the story of the snowy day and the Equal Rights Amendment. I think I've shared this story before, but to me it, it summed up in my years of reporting on democracy, local democracy for the newspaper, um, how much your vote counts. So I don't know if people will cast their minds back. If you're in the Brattleboro area, we had a select board race. Uh, two of the candidates, Dick DeGray, who was an incumbent, 
and Avery um, Schwenk, who, who was uh, running for the same seat. And this, I believe the vote was finally fell to in Dick's favor, but I think this vote went through two recounts. Mm. And I think there were a few weeks before we knew who would have this seat. But in all cases, what flipped the vote in all cases was like two votes. Like that's all it took. And I know that is a small local story and it's a select board. Maybe it's not as big a deal for some folks, but really the number of people who wrote to me after that story came out, the article came out and said, I was gonna go to the polls and vote for so-and-so, but I didn't. And now I realize it could have made a difference. Mm -hmm. And it was some of the most response and email I've gotten mm -hmm. to an article. So yes, like one or two votes can be all it takes. And Brush the so snow sure off your vote. car. And, and November, given climate change, we may not have snow. <laughs> Great. So you don't even have that excuse. Mm -hmm. Or you can vote by mail. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> you can vote by mail. Thanks, legislature. Um, thank you. You can vote early uh, in case it snows on election day and you want to get it done. And you know what? We are making history here, Vermont, with the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. You are going to want to be able to tell folks in 50 years that you voted yes on this thing. And so get ready, it's, it's gonna come soon. And I don't know that if anyone has said this yet in the show, but if this amendment passes, Vermont will be the first state to protect reproductive liberties in its constitution. Mm -hmm. So see, if you love, if you love be, being able to claim those things as, as Charlie said, no, I've got the tears. Thanks. Oh, yay. It's always a good show when somebody cries. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Charlie, for, for joining us today. And yes, please send me your contact information. I will put, them, put it in the show notes. Emily, if folks want to find out more information about what you've been up to and uh, any public conversations you're having, where can they go? Well, folks can always listen to the podcast to hear about what I've been up to, as well as past episodes. But if you'd like more about the work, you can go to emilykornheiser.org, where you can find links to all of my social media channels, to um, newsletters, to announcements about what's coming up soon. Um, hope to put out a newsletter in the next couple of days about what the session's going to look like and look forward to hearing from people. Thank you. And I want to toast um to to charlie and to you and to all the people who have found the language and the time and the courage to share their stories to make this proposition possible so cheers cheers, cheers. As always, folks, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on Fridays on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, BCTV, uh, wherever you find your podcasts, as well as our website, the Montpelier Happy Hour .captivate .fm. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks.